Church said, Amen. Father, we thank you for the Bible study tonight. Thank you for everything we have learned already. We pray, Lord, that all these things will be written on the table of every heart. And Lord, the passion, the fire, the fervency, the pursuit, you grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. We pray that any passion we have lost, any fire we have lost, any commitment we have lost, you restore to everyone abundantly in Jesus' name. Open the pages of the scriptures to everyone, even tonight. And we pray that the grace to abide in the word, to live like the word teaches us, and to move on in everything, every action, according to your word, your grant to every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Members, ministers, parents, children, long-time believers, and newcomers, we pray, we'll follow your word step by step, day after day, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You must give me another amen before you sit down. Amen. God bless you. We're coming to Galatians chapter 2. And today we're looking at verses 11, 12, 13, and 14. Galatians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. And then in verse 12, it says, For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. Then in verse 13, and the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, in so much that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Now in verse 14, but when I saw that they walked not uprightly, According to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter, Before them all, if thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We thank the Lord for the passage of scripture we're looking at today. It's one of the evidences that the Bible is the word of God. Normally when you write the story, the history of great men, and you write their autobiography, you do not put some of these things there that might bring them to bad light. Why should there be any disagreement between Barnabas and Paul that's written in the Bible? Why should there be any kind of dissembling or dissimulation in the action of Peter that's written in the Bible? How should Paul confront Peter because of what he has done that's written in the Bible? And we need to remember that whatsoever things were written at all times, they were reaching forward learning that we through the comfort and the patience of scriptures might have hope. So today we're looking at preserving the truth of the gospel at all costs. Preserving. And there is what Paul the Apostle did. He saw that the truth of the gospel was being turned upside down. He saw that the truth of the gospel was being eroded into and he wanted and he had to defend the gospel, the truth of the gospel. Why do we have to preserve the truth of the gospel? Because if the gospel is changed, 
a mutilated gospel cannot save. If the gospel is changed, a modified gospel cannot save. If the gospel is changed, a watered down gospel cannot save. That's the reason why, because Paul the Apostle was interested in the salvation of people, both Jews and Gentiles. So he had to defend the truth of the gospel, preserve the truth of the gospel, so that this gospel will remain as God has given us. And if it remains as God has given us, then people will hear the gospel, the true gospel, the perfect gospel, the heavenly gospel, the saving gospel, the transforming gospel, and the gospel that changes not. And so those who hear will be able to respond to that gospel. They'll give their lives to the Lord and they will be saved as it was then. So it should be today that every one of us ministers, every one of us preachers, every one of us leaders, every one of us soul winners should preserve the truth of the gospel at all costs. Preserving the truth of the gospel at all costs. There are three things we're looking at today in the message. Number one, the danger of pillars shifting from the foundation. That's what happened to Peter. He was a pillar in the kingdom, a pillar in the church, a pillar in the New Testament. And now the pillar was shifting from the foundation and that's very dangerous and the same thing with us today any preacher well-known preacher any preacher a preacher that is known all over the world or maybe all over our nation maybe all over our state maybe in our church if it sheets from the foundation that's very dangerous because many will backslide and many will lose their faith and their hope in the Lord, the danger of pillars shifting from the foundation. Number two, the dissembling of partners shaken by fear. After Peter um, kind of dissembled and he went, he left the place where he was before. When those Jews came from James, Barnabas and others, they also dissembled with him. And they said, if Peter is afraid of those people coming from Jerusalem, who am I? And so we have the dissembling of partners shaken by fear. Fear of man is very, very dangerous. The fear of man will bring a snare. The fear of a man, a woman, high people, great people, forceful people, the fear of their face and the fear of their comment. What will they say? What will they do? How will they react? How will they respond? That fear, the fear of anyone in our lives will bring us near and lead us astray. And not only lead us astray, a leader's sin it's a leading sin. It will lead other people astray to the dissembling of partners shaken by fear. Number three, the defense by Paul. Steadfast in the faith. The defense by Paul. Paul the apostle. Thank God we have a person like Paul the apostle that when everybody was going the other direction, he could stand alone and he could stand for the truth. Thank God today you can be a man like that because if everybody fell, I will stand. If everybody compromised, who will be conqueror? If everybody went astray, who will stand on the truth of the word of God? It's good for you in the time of the Old Testament. There was a Daniel, a Daniel that was stand alone. And then his three companions and friends go follow him. In the time of the New Testament, we have this man, Paul the Apostle, and he could stand. And because he stood, the word is now preserved for us. I pray the Lord will make a Paul out of you. And make you stand whatever is happening around you in Jesus' name. 
the defense by Paul steadfast in the faith. Let's come to number one. Number one, we have the danger of pillars shifting from the foundation. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, the immutability of the saving pillar of truth. There's the pillar of truth. Apart from a human being, apart from a preacher, apart from an apostle, being a pillar, the pillar of truth. That's the pillar on which we build the temple of truth. I will build everything we want to build because the temple of truth, the truth of the gospel must stand on a pillar, the immutability of the saving pillar of truth. Number two, the instability of some pillars in the temple. The temple is the church. The temple is the whole thing that we have under the saving grace of God. And there are some of the pillars there, some of the preachers there, some of the pastors there, some of the people there that were shaking. They were unstable. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. The instability of some pillars in the temple. Number three, the importance of steadfast perseverance without timidity. The importance of holding on and standing fast and remaining solid, unshakable, steadfast, perseverance without timidity. Let's look at number one, is the immutability of the saving pillar of truth. We're told in 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15, 1 Timothy chapter 3, reading from verse 15, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. The church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of truth. If the church is anything at all, the church should be holding forth and holding out the truth of the gospel and the church then becomes the depository becomes the place where you deposit the truth the whole truth and if you're looking for the truth you come to the church and the church is the pillar of truth and is the ground of truth and those who are preachers then in the church must stand like pillars and stand for the truth of the word of God. In G Jeremiah chapter 1, reading from verse 9. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9. Then the Lord put forth his hand, and he touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. I have put my words in thy mouth. I have put the perfect word. I have put the fullness of the word. I have put the complete revelation in your mouth. I have put my words in thy mouth. What did that make Jeremiah? Having the truth, loving the truth, possessing the truth preaching the truth, announcing the truth, putting forth the truth of the word of God. Look at verse 18. In verse 18, For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city and an iron pillar. Without the truth, without the gospel, Jeremiah could not be a pillar. Without the truth, without the revelation, Peter could not be a pillar. What makes anyone a dependable pillar? What makes anyone a standing pillar? What makes anyone a pillar to be reckoned with in the church of the living God is that he has the truth, the true gospel, 
the word of God, the gospel, and he retains and he holds on to that truth. And the Lord said, For behold, I have made thee this day a defense city and an iron pillar and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. Let's come to First Corinthians chapter 3, reading from verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 10 According to the grace of God Which is given unto me As a wise master builder I have laid the foundation And another buildeth thereon But let every man take heed How he buildeth thereon Look at verse 11 In verse 11 he tells us For all the foundation can no man lay And that is laid which is Christ Jesus is that foundation in Christ Christ as Savior Christ alone without circumcision Christ as sanctifier Christ alone without the ceremony of the Old Testament Christ the baptizer in the Holy Ghost Christ alone without drinking from river Jordan Christ the healer Christ alone without all the herbs and everything Christ the Redeemer Christ the Redeemer without other people becoming a co-redemptor or Redeemer with him Christ other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And then we're told in 2 Timothy chapter 2, reading from verse 19. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, nevertheless, the foundation of God stand the show, having the seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ. Depart from iniquity, depart from corruption, depart from corrupting the word of God, and depart from corrupting their own lives, the immutability of the saving pillar of truth. Let's come to number two now. Number two, the instability of some pillars in the temple. The instability of some pillars in the temple. We're coming to Galatians chapter 2, reading from verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. That wasn't expected of Peter. The same thing with us, any of us who are pastors, who are preachers, who are overseers, who are leaders, who are workers, and who are being taught the truth. The Lord expects that we'll stand by the truth, stand for the truth, stand for the truth, and present the truth at every opportunity to everyone we come across. But as it was in the Old Testament, it also spilled over to the New Testament. You remember Ophni and Phinehas? They derailed. You remember Nadab and Abihu? They derailed. You remember Aaron? He didn't stand on the word, and the people were led into idolatry. You remember many people that have gone away from the truth of the word, and now we come to the New Testament. And Peter himself, writing his epistle, second epistle of Peter, chapter 2, he said, There were false prophets in those days, and there shall be false teachers among you. Unfortunately, Peter himself fell into that kind of situation. It was a situation of compromise. 
a situation of not being strong, a situation of fearing man more than the Messiah, and fearing the people around him more than the Lord God of heaven. Now, to point accusing finger to Peter is one thing, and for you to understand in your own moment of confrontation, in your own moment of uh, when people come uh, that you respect and you honor, and then you have a stand to take, and you have the words to defend, for you to be able to stand, it will take really a good experience of salvation, a good experience of sanctification, a good experience of baptism and power and courage and boldness in the Holy Ghost. But now we're told about Peter that he was to be blamed. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, for before that certain came from James, that's James in Jerusalem, he did each of the Gentiles. He did each of the Gentiles. No big deal already when God called Peter to the house of Cornelius already he was there and he spent some days with them he slept in the house they provided Gentiles he ate the food they provided and they knew already that the Lord had broken down that middle wall of partition they knew already that Peter went to the else of Cornelius and he etched there the even challenged him look at Acts chapter 11 reading from verse 2 Acts chapter 11 we're reading from verse 2 it says there and when Peter was come unto Jerusalem they that were of the circumcision contended with him what a pity they contended about a non-essential they contended about eating food. They contended about what goes in and then will you pass it out. And Jesus had told them before he left, he said, it is not what enters into the man, like food, like drink, that corrupts the man, defiles the man. It is what comes out of the man. Now they challenged him, they said, Peter, well, what have you done? You've gone to the uncircumcised Gentiles and you have eaten with them. Look at verse 3. In verse 3 it says, saying, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised and did eat with them. In verse 4. Verse 4 tells us what Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them look at verse 8 in verse 8 but i said not so lord for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth verse 9 and then it says in verse 9 but the voice answered me again from heaven that should have settled it once and forever the voice answered me again from heaven what god has cleansed that call not thou come on then in verse 10 in verse 10 and this was done three times and all were drawn up again into heaven and then in verse 11 it says in verse 11 and behold, immediately there were three men already come unto the house where I was sent from Caesarea unto me. Verse 12, verse 12 says, And the Spirit bid me go. And the Spirit bid me go. That's the Holy Spirit above James above John, above any of the people from Judah or Jerusalem. That's the Holy Spirit high above any man on earth. And that should have settled it for Peter. And the Spirit made me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, 
these six brethren accompanied me and we entered into the man's house but now look at what peter has done we must look at our personal lives and if we have this crippling fear of man this terrorizing fear of man this intimidating fear of man and we put our lives into the hands of a man of a woman and we know the truth the truth of salvation and the truth of righteousness and the truth of restitution and the truth of sanctification and the truth of purity of heart and the truth of abiding in the word of god without adding without subtracting if we know the truth that this is what to preach and this is what to lay by and then the fear of man will not allow us to do what the lord has revealed we should do we might eventually miss heaven. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man shall be ashamed of him in the kingdom of God before his heavenly Father. I pray will be steadfast. I said I pray will be steadfast. I'll wait for your amen. amen. You know, Peter could have then looked at Paul, and Peter could have said, Paul, I've been there before you came. I knew Christ in the physical. All the time you were persecuting the church, I was already an apostle. And you say that against me. Peter could have found a way to fight back. And Peter could have found a way to tell the old, old story of what Paul used to be. You make me come to shame publicly. Then you could have dug into the history of Paul and you could have brought something on you too. You too. You too. Look at what you were. That's, those are the people that don't like correction. They're incorrigible. And so when you say anything that will correct them openly, because Paul the Apostle did it openly, they have the tendency of saying we can dig out something too and throw that into the public and throw that into the social media so that he too will face the ship. What was the attitude of Peter? Look at Second Peter chapter 3. And we're reading from verse 14. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 14. Wherefore, beloved, here is Peter writing, seeing that she look for such things, be diligent that she may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Peter was saying, have you heard about what I did? Have you heard about my compromise? Have you heard about my dissembling? Don't follow that. Make sure because Christ is coming, I have been corrected and I'm taking the correction. Make sure that you are found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Look at verse 15. It says, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul. Look at Peter. Instead of fighting back, instead of throwing mud at him or stone at him, instead of using his position, using his experience, and using his opportunity to also write an epistle, instead of using that to throw that at him, he said, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom that is given unto him as written unto you. He said that Paul is a man of wisdom. That Paul is a man without compromise. That Paul is a man that loves the truth and believes the truth above even me. Look at that. Can you do that? If something had happened 
that you were revealed probably directly probably indirectly and you then said how could he say that why didn't he call me to the into the private place and then tell me in such a nice way in such a good way how could he do that and just throw it out like that before everybody can you do like peter and say he has wisdom he has understanding he has revelation and he's a beloved brother paul look at verse 16 it says as also in all his epistles he says all the epistles that Paul has written, he wrote in the wisdom of God. He says, you may come across the epistle to the Galatians. He even confronted me there, but in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do also the other scriptures. Understand the language? His epistles, the other scriptures. He affirmed that the epistles of Paul were part of scripture. He didn't say, no, I'll not affirm him. I'll not confirm him. I will not honor him. I will not give any public honor unto him and say he wrote in wisdom, he wrote in good revelation, and he wrote the scripture. No, I will not do that because look at what he did to me. There are people who say they are Christians. There are people who say they are sanctified. And something that had happened seven years ago, ten years ago, the preacher, the pastor was preaching and he pointed at them and he said, hey church, we must correct this. That is not right. And then singled out and said, brother so-and-so, sister so-and-so, what he has done, we will not allow it here. This is the pillar of truth and the church of the living God. It happened 10 years ago and that is still in the mind. That is still in the heart. Where is the sanctification we talk about, we sing about, we preach about, we pray about, and we tell other people if we're sanctified, Thank God for somebody who is able to correct us. Somebody who is able to rise up and say, that is not right. Now, Peter had a good attitude. That's the evidence that a person is a real child of God, is a real minister of God. It says they rest the scriptures unto their own destruction. Now, in verse 17, verse 17 says, Ye therefore, beloved, seen, ye know these things before, beware, lest ye also be led away with the error of the wicked and fall from your own steadfastness. He said, whatever you see I've done and I wasn't steadfast, you stand straight and you stand firm and you hold firm and you hold on and make sure that you are steadfast every moment until the very end. The Lord grant us grace. The Lord grant us power. And the God, Lord grant us the fortitude to stand firm in everything, every day, to the end of our lives, in Jesus' name. We're coming to number three here. Number three, the importance of steadfast perseverance without timidity. The importance of steadfast perseverance without timidity. We're coming to Second Samuel chapter 12, reading from verse 1. Second Samuel chapter 12, verse 1, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him, and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. Verse 2. In verse 2, the rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. Verse 3, verse 3 says, But the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, 
which he had bought and nourished up. And it grew together with him and with his children. He did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. In verse 4, it says in verse 4, And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and his pet to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress it to prepare it for the wayfaring man that was come unto him but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it prepared it for the man that was come to him then in verse 5 and David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that has done this thing shall surely die. Look at verse 6. And he said, And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing. And because he had no pity. Verse 7, verse 7 says, And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. You know the story. But can you be that bold? Can you confront a David, a leader? Can you confront somebody who is supposed to live a righteous life? Who's supposed to lead the people, but is committed adultery and has even killed the man, the husband of that woman, and he has taken that woman to himself to add to his many wives. Can you discipline such a person? Can you talk to such a person? Can you confront such a person? Can you speak to such a person? Are you just, will you be gossiping, talking under your voice and putting everything under the carpet? And when he calls you, you say, say, yes, sir, yes, sir. You have it in your heart. You have it in your mind. Is the one polluting the gospel? Is the one corrupting the gospel? Is the one mutilating the gospel? Is the one destroying the church and destroying the truth in the church? And yet, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. You do not have the backbone of Nathan. You do not have the backbone of Paul to say, this is not right. Thou art the man. Uh, that is why we're studying the scriptures. We're studying the scriptures so that when the time comes for us to stand straight and to stand firm and to correct what needs to be corrected, we'll be able to do that. Not that we are waiting and then the pastor now comes and boldly he says, we won't have that in our church, we won't have that in the kingdom, we won't have that in the ministry. And then uh, instead of correcting and instead of shaping up and still honoring the man that can speak the truth and speak the truth to everyone, no matter who, instead of respecting the man, then we join the people who are unhappy with the man and they're saying, oh, is he talking like that? They'll say, one deeper like to go back to 1973, 77. As have we not changed? Look at where we are now. Are we now not modern? Modern. Your Bible has become modern. Your Bible remain the way it ought to remain in Jesus' name. I said you remain in Jesus' name. You'll abide in the truth. You will not run away from the truth. You will not escape the truth. You will not get up and say, if that is the truth of salvation, if that is the truth of righteousness, then I pick my bag. I'm going. Where are you going? If you go away from the truth, you go to hell. But 
you stand and you say that is the truth and I, I believe that because this church is standing on the truth I will abide in the truth in Jesus name look at it all these many years I got converted 1964 and 1964 to 2022 that's a long time by the grace of God I stand on the whole Bible anybody joining me anybody affirming the truth anybody that will stand and have a backbone that when somebody does something wrong in your presence you have the boldness you have the courage to say no Peter no David that should not be the Lord will give you backbone to do that in Jesus name we're now coming to number a uh, number that's point number two now point number two the dissembling of uh, partners shaking by fear in Galatians chapter 2 reading from verse 13 and the other Jews dissembled likewise with him that is with Peter in so much that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation three things here the disastrous example of feebleness in ministers when a minister like Peter what we have read when he's feeble when he's weak when he doesn't have backbone when it's like jellyfish, when it's not dependable, and then it's wobbling. How disastrous is that? Number two, the disabling effect of fear of man. Disabling just tunes you up, just makes you totally weak, and disables you from doing what you ought to do and from saying what you ought to say number three the damning emulation and feeding on misinterpretations let's look at number one here the disastrous example of feebleness in ministers we've read galatians already let's see now in first corinthians chapter five we're looking at verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. Your glory in is not good. What it means by that is, when he saw evil, they didn't confront evil. They were saying, that is our wisdom. Quietness, that is our wisdom. Glossing over matters, that is our wisdom not confronting evil not confronting backsliding that is our wisdom seeing people going astray and defiling the church of the living god and they keep quiet they said that is the glory of our wisdom there are people that think that wisdom is not telling the truth wisdom is avoiding the truth wisdom is not confronting error Wisdom is not speaking when we ought to speak out. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven liveth the whole lump? A little leaven liveth the whole lump. A little compromise. A little kind of giving in to the weakness of the flesh. I won't talk because if I talk, they will understand that can corrupt the whole congregation look at verse 11 in verse 11 it tells us but now i have reached unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator and you know or covetous and you know it or an idolater and you know it or a railer and you know it or a drunkard or an extortioner well such and one know not to eat if you know anyone that is called a brother a sister a member of the church 
and he's doing something in the office that is already open in the office there and they know that that person that office they say the way he's doing and he says it's a deep alive member if you know anyone standing on the pulpit and preaching to you in our church and yet he's living a kind of a corrupted life a sinful life a backsliding life you know it and you are just well i won't talk about it who am i to talk about it who am i myself am i in heaven yet if that is his weakness don't i have my weakness then you are you're defending, you're covering up a backslider and a little leaven, leanness, the whole lump. He wants to, to speak out, not to destroy them, to help them, to correct them so that they'll come out of their sin, come out of darkness, and come out of right, and come to righteousness and to the light in Jesus' name. Did I hear any amen now? Yeah. In First uh, Corinthians chapter 15, uh, reading from verse 33. First Corinthians chapter 15, uh, reading from verse 33. It says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. And then in verse 34, it says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. We're looking at uh, Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 cried Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Whatever Jesus condemned in his lifetime, he still condemns today. Whatever Jesus upheld in his lifetime is still opposed today. Whatever Jesus preached, righteousness that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of scribes and the Pharisees shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. The message of Christ is still the same. The commandment of Christ is still the same. The expectation of Christ is still the same. The truth in Christ is still the same. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Look at verse 9. In verse 9 it says, Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Look at number two here. Number two, the disabling effect of, of the fear of man. If you have the fear of man, it disables you. It's like it switches you off. You are plugged to the socket, and because of that, there is power, electricity, and it's able to turn your fan. It's able to cool your fridge. It's able to make uh, your cooker hot. But now you disable the connection. When you disable the connection, nothing works. No power, no strength, no fire, no coolness, no righteousness, nothing. Prayer will not work. Preaching will not work. All that we're doing will not scratch any surface because the fear of man has disabled us. Fear will vanish away. By the way, what are we afraid of? Pharaoh, look at his end. How can we be afraid of him? Nebuchadnezzar, what are we afraid of? Look at the end. Are oh, you afraid of him? Beshaza of all people, the drunken man, the idolatrous man. What are we afraid of? What's the end of him? Lions den. What are we afraid of? Daniel went there and he came out. You go in there, you'll come out in Jesus' name. Nebuchadnezzar's furnace. What are we afraid of? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They went in and they came out. You will come out. And all the Pharisees and all the Sadducees, everything they did and everything they threatened, what's the outcome? Where are they today? What are you afraid of? We will not be afraid of man anymore. Amen. 
disabling effect of the fear of man look at first samuel chapter 15 in first samuel chapter 15 i'm reading from verse 22 and samuel said at the lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the lord behold to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams look at verse 23 there and for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He, the Lord too, has also rejected thee from being king. That's so. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, and so said unto Samuel, I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people. Because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. When you were saved, what was your passion? What was your pursuit? What was your purpose of heart? when you were saved what drove you to your knees for sanctification how did you pray how did you consecrate your life at sanctification and when you came out of that altar being sanctified how did you feel in your heart and the first problem and the first challenge that confronted you when you were sanctified you remember how bold you are you remember how um, kind of standing steadfast you were what changed you what turned you around what made you so fearful why are you fidgeting and why are you going through life now under fear if you want to do anything now you look here you look there is so and so there is so and so there what's the matter have you forgotten the price Christ paid for you, for you to get saved? And then he sends you on an errand and he says, this is what you do. And you never think about Christ anymore, about the Holy Ghost anymore, about the Word of God anymore, about the power of the Holy Ghost anymore. And all you're thinking about now, that man, that woman, what will he say? What will she say? Will she frown? Will he frown? Will he accept or will he reject? Fear of man. And then Saul had to say, I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words because I feared now. It's unreasonable fear. Saul, the people, what could they do? The people, could they tell me, dethrone you from being a king? No, they could not. Could they replace him? No, they could not. Will they fight him instead of fighting the Philistines? No, they will not. Even if they ran away from you and left you there, a little boy, one David, destroyed the Philistines. And you, you are higher and taller and greater than David. What's your problem? Our fears are unreasonable. Our fretting unreasonable our fidgeting unreasonable what could they take away from you they can't take your salvation they can't take your hope of heaven they can't take your joy they can't take the truth away from you what are we afraid of he said because i feared the people and obeyed their voice that fear is cancelled in jesus name i will not fear i said i will not fear you're not fear in Jesus' name. 
and when that fear is cancelled and you live in the word of god by the word of god in the fullness of the revelation of the word of god the lord will promote you yeah. we're coming to number three here number three the damning emulation and feeding of misinterpretation emulation emulation that word emulation we we'll see other people because peter dissembled barnabas also followed and many other people too they followed emulation looking at people not looking at the word of god looking at people not looking unto jesus the author and the finisher of our faith looking at people what they will say what they will do and what will happen looking at people and not looking unto christ alone look unto me all ye the ends of the earth and be ye saved and be ye healed and be ye delivered of the ends of the earth we look unto the lord alone all the time and even when you see the people you make nothing of that because christ has not become all in all in your life i say christ has become all in all in your life amen and because of that every threatening situation will come under your feet every threatening man or woman will come under your feet and you will stand like a real soldier of the cross ought to stand we're not feeble civilians we are strong and powerful soldiers of christ in jesus name can you think of a soldier running back from the battlefield and then you confront him what did you run from the battlefield i saw a child by the way and that child was doing like this to me you're a soldier you're going to the battlefield and one child is doing like this to you that's why you run. go back there and go and face that challenge you will win the battle we're looking at the word of god and we're looking at galatians chapter 5 from verse 19 it says in verse 19 now the works of the flesh are manifest which are these adultery fornication uncleanness lasciviousness look at verse 20 and then in verse 20 it tells us idolatry witchcraft hatred variance emulations emulations you don't commit fornication but you have emulation you don't commit adultery but you have emulation you don't you are not a witch but you have emulations and you don't have hatred but you have emulation you don't have wrath but you have emulation you don't have strife you don't have sedition heresies your only problem is you cannot stand alone you cannot stand firm you cannot stand without looking at somebody and emulating them and copying them that's the challenge and it makes you to be grouped with the idolaters and adulterers and fornicators and the witches and all the sorcerers and everybody and then it says in verse 21 in verse 21 it tells us envies murders drunkenness rebellions and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things, emulation included, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. They which do such things, emulations, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I think it's better for everyone to get back our backbone, our strength our courage our boldness and not be cringing and crawling and you know whatever and it was so timid and so fearful because of what anybody will do emulations copying the people that go astray that backslide for any reason it will make us eventually lose and miss the kingdom of god because the fearful the abominable and the sorcerers and all liars shall have their part in the lake that burneth with brimstone and with fire. I pray that will not be your Lord. That will not be my Lord. 
I will stand. I said I will stand. You will stand in Jesus' name. Now we're coming to we're coming to point number three. Point number three, the defense by Paul, steadfast in the faith. Look at it again. We're looking at Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face. That's Paul the Apostle. I pray the same grace every one of us will have and the same boldness every one of us will have and the same steadfastness every one of us will have in Jesus name he said I will stood him to the face you know sometimes if someone is 